Sports, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Olumide McCollum. Hello and welcome. Tonight, 40 years after eradicating smallpox, Nigeria and the rest of Africa is certified polio-free. President Mohamed Buhari lists poverty, eradication, education and health care amongst nine priority focus of his government in the next three years. Speakers at the United Nations and European Union joint platform see collective approach to end gender-based violence in Nigeria and father of a black man shot severely in the back by Wisconsin police says his son is paralyzed from the waist down. Plus business, sports and later from our studios in London. On business news tonight, President Buhari approves one-year deferment of 35% import levy imposed on electricity meters. And in sports news tonight, Lionel Messi tells FC Barcelona he wants to leave the football club this summer after nearly two decades at the Camp Nou. Nigeria and indeed Africa got a clean bill in the fight against polio as the World Health Organization declared the continent free of the disease. This is coming 40 years after the continent got rid of smallpox, another infectious disease that ravaged the world, particularly Africa, in the 1980s. With this cherry news, President Mohamed Buhari, who joined the certification ceremony virtually from the State House in Abuja, believes that African countries can defeat the COVID-19 pandemic the same way they eradicated polio. Our correspondent Kayla Megwa reports. Nigeria is the last country in Africa to be declared free of poliomyelitis after accounting for more than half of the cases around the world less than 10 years ago. Around the world, only two countries still have the virus, Pakistan and Afghanistan. 2016 was the last time Nigeria recorded any new case of the wild polio virus and it was discovered in Borno State. Being the epicenter of the Boko Haram insurgency, it was difficult for health workers to take the much needed vaccines there. And this is in addition to a lot of misinformation about the polio vaccine in many parts of northern Nigeria. If you can assure everybody in the world that up in Borno, in those areas where we cannot get into, if you can find a way to assure us that there is no polio there, oh, the African region will be satisfied after, you know, after three years. In 2013, Nine female polio vaccinators were killed after a radio broadcast claimed the vaccine was a population control tool. This happened in Kano State. Most of our workers uh, come in tight with harassment of her um, parents because they don't know the importance of this polio. polio. So we used to convince them. We used to give them advice and the good side of this implementation. The back and forth over Nigeria's polio status was our collective embarrassment, particularly in 2016, after going two years without any new infections. So it was time to ensure a collective effort. That collective effort has paid off with this certification. President Muhammadu Buhari, while delivering his address at the event commemorating the certification, says this is a promise kept by his administration. I recall that shortly after assuming office in 2015, I made a pledge to Nigerians that I would not bequeath a fellow endemic country to my successor. This certification is therefore a personal fulfillment of that pledge do not only Nigerians, but to all Africans. At a time when the global community is battling with COVID-19 pandemic, this achievement strengthens my conviction that with the requisite political will, investments, and strategies, as well as citizens' commitment, we will flatten the endemic curve. I can affirm the commitment 
of all African leaders in this course of action. Now, all that must happen is to ensure this status remains. The financial implications and loss of lives caused by the wild polio virus must come to an end. From the State House in Abuja, Kayla Megwa, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, President Mohamed Buhari is offering an assurance that his administration will, amongst other things, use the remaining three years in office to improve access to quality education, health care, power, and enhance productivity. These sum up the nine priority areas listed by the president today when he received letters of credence from ambassadors and high commissioners of eight countries at the State House today. He told them that efforts are being made to sustain Nigeria's position and as a profitable investment destination with unequal incentives in all sectors, especially a large market and flexible tax system. According to the president, the focus over the next few years will be to build a thriving and sustainable economy, enhance social inclusion and reduce poverty, enlarge agricultural output for food security and export, attain energy sufficiency in power and petroleum products, and expand transport and other infrastructure development. Other areas listed by President Buhari include expanding business growth and industrialization, access to quality education, affordable health care, and the fight against corruption. He also assured the diplomats that Nigeria will remain steadfast in pursuing deeper and valuable relations amongst nations without discrimination. Moving on to other stories, participants and keynote speakers at the Spotlight Initiative, a United Nations, European Union and Partners joint platform are demanding that the issue of gender-based violence must assume a collective approach to stop a growing trend across the world and particularly in Nigeria. UN Resident Coordinator Mr. Edward Kalon and other speakers at the three-hour town hall meeting asked for a societal-based approach that will make perpetrators of gender-based violence face the wrath of the law. They also shared their views on how gender-based violence has remained a pandemic that has plagued the world for a long time. Our correspondent, Gimba Omar, reports. Challenges of culture. An attendance that represents the gravity of gender-based violence and its overbearing weight on society. Girls, women and children mostly have bared the brunt. And I'm going to come to you now, Ambassador. The United Nations and the European Union front row advocates against rape traced the root cause and wasted no time to proffer solutions. That comes back to the issues of poverty, the issues of being able to, to provide for yourself, the issues of being able to meet your responsibility as, as members of the family. At times, we, we push this under the carpet. We try to look at it from aggressive acts, in the, either at the household level, etc. But the issues are as deep as they are heartbreaking. The story of Fatima Ishaku tends to draw one to a breaking point. So sorry, when you say you told your mom and she asked you to keep quiet, did you, was well, that how it ended? No, what happened after? They took me to the village for tra traditional cleansing. Oh, you went for cleansing? Did dad go for cleansing? No, he did not go. He didn't go. Oh, he didn't go for cleansing? No. Just you? Yes, because the family did not want her to marry the man. And he's supposed to dance around the market. So I was the one that went. So they, after the cleansing, they brought something for him to eat. So he hated me. He started dealing with me. My mom had to move me out from the house. Took me to my uncle's place. Two years later, my mother died. We have to come back to the house. Then that was when the rape started. Non-government organizations are also mindful of the atrocities meted out on many, most of them vulnerable and poor. It's made worse when, do, when they do not receive support from the society, when people turn to favor the perpetrators instead of the survivors. So you get to see um, community members coming to beg survivors to drop the case. The challenges for the survivors and victims alike are now getting to a boiling point. 3,600 cases reported in the country, 799 are suspected cases, while 631 are investigated and charged to court. Legislation here may be the answer. Enforcement of the law is critical, and that's why the example the Honourable Minister gave you of what we did in EGT when we started the Sexual Offenders Register in 2013 has now morphed into what we call a naming and shaming policy. That all of the laws that we have made uh, that are derivable 
from this chapter four, this section, take four of the constitution, all prescribe penal consequences, strict penal consequences that are consistent with global uh, benchmarks. The Solicitor General of the Federation, in his submission on the matter, believes the strategy must be reset. Issues of violence seems to have caught the attention of Nigerians working in world organizations, with many agreeing that there must be zero tolerance to gender-based violence and the domestication of the Child Rights Act in different states must be implemented to the letter. Gimba Umar, Channels Television News. Now let's get some more insight on Nigeria and indeed Africa's polio free status as declared by the World Health Organization today. And joining us on the news at 10 tonight is the Minister of Health, Dr. Osage Eanire. You're welcome to the news at 10. This Thank is no you. good evening. Good evening to you, sir. Now, this is no doubt cherry news for all Nigerians. Can you walk us through the journey to this destination? Well, it's been a very long journey, and we have reached a pivotal destination. Uh, as Nelson Mandela said, those kick polio out of Africa. We have uh, reached that goal. So Nigeria is uh, proud to be among the nations that are now fully polio free. Uh, the last case was in 2016, uh, August to be precise, four years ago. And uh, since uh, three years ago, since last year, since uh, a year ago, since 2019, the process of verification has been going on and concluded now for the regional office of the WHO to declare Nigeria polio free. Now, being polio free is no doubt fantastic news, but what are the chances are of a resurgence? Well, the chances of resurgence are chances that we can control if we build up our routine immunization, which we intend to do. We are now at about 70% coverage. We know that the remaining 30% is more difficult. So we are developing strategies to expand the coverage up to 90%. Uh, the difficult areas will be hard to reach uh, areas and areas that you pr probably not find their transport. So we have acquired motorcycles that will be able to carry uh, vaccinators all the way to what we call the last mile. Uh, in, in addition, we're expanding the primary health care structure uh, to provide services of which uh, routine immunization is the key. And uh, if we have a platform of functional primary health care centers, routine immunization, well established, and uh, uh, the surveillance uh, principle set up, we are carrying out uh, very strict uh, uh, acute flaccid paralysis surveillance, then we should have control of the uh, polio uh, eradication and um, be able to maintain it. And no doubt, there's no better time than this than to ask you the next question. How optimistic are you about Nigeria surmounting COVID-19 the way we've defeated polio? Well, uh, COVID-19 is a different a kettle of fish altogether. It is a virus that is a very easily transmitted in a different way and it has spread all over the world, as you will see, in a way that polio did not spread, in a way that, in fact, Ebola did not spread. So it's peculiar in itself. But we have had a lot of lessons that we learned from the polio, ex from the polio experience and also from the Ebola experience. And it has helped us very much. Nigeria has a virus disease hospital in Irua, from where we have brought specialists who have uh, been very helpful in setting up our strategy. And uh, the Ministry of Health has already now created a, a national uh, response action plan for, that will cover the next three years of responding to uh, COVID-19. The uh, uh, response plan has to be very specific and very flexible because not everything is known about the COVID-19 virus. But every day we are learning more and more about it and uh, responding uh, with, with the knowledge we know and also waiting for uh, vaccines to be developed, for perhaps within the next one year. We hope that that happens to be the case. Thank you so much for your time, for coming on the News at 10 tonight. Thank you for inviting me. Dr. Osage Hanire, the Minister of Health on the News at 10. Now, in part two after the break, suspected internet fraudster Hush Puppy denies four counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud 
international money laundering as court fixes its trial for October the 13th. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. 40 years after eradicating smallpox, Nigeria and the rest of Africa is certified polio-free. President Mohamed Wari lists poverty eradication, education and health care amongst nine priority focus areas of his government in the next three years. Speakers at the United Nations and European Union joint platform seek collective approach to end gender-based violence in Nigeria. And father of black man shot severely in the back by Wisconsin police says his son is paralyzed from the waist down. Our website, ChannelsTV.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser. Or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV and Roku. And now let's turn our attention to legal matters. Suspected internet fraudster Ramon Abbas, also known as Hush Puppy, has been arraigned in an American court in California as his trial is set to begin on October the 13th. In June, the 37-year-old, known for displaying an opulent lifestyle in social media, was arrested in Dubai by special operatives of the Emirates Police and American Federal Bureau of Investigation. Hush Puppy, alongside Olali Kwanli, popularly known as Woodbury, was extradited to Chicago, in the U.S., where he was first arraigned in July. He pleaded not guilty to the four counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, money laundering conspiracy, international money laundering, and engaging in monetary transactions in property derived from unspecified lawful activity. Back in Nigeria, Governor Yahya Bello of Kogi State and two others who contested the 2019 governorship election in the state will know their fate on August the 31st when the Supreme Court will decide on the disputed election. A seven-man panel of the Apex Court presided over by the Chief Justice Ibrahim Mohamed fixed the date in two separate appeals challenging the victory of Governor Bello shortly after hearing submissions of lawyers to the parties in separate suits. The appeals are that of the candidate of the People's Democratic Party and that of the Social Democratic Party, Natasha Akwoti. It's a calm atmosphere as the PDP governorship candidate in Kogi State, Mr. Musa Wada, pleads with the Apex Court to allow his appeal. His lawyer, Jibrino Kutepa, also asks the court to grant their reliefs. Lawyer to Governor Bello, Joseph Daudu, and that of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Dr. Alex Izion, have however asked the court to dismiss the appeal for lack of merit. Mr. Daudu specifically pleaded with the Apex Court to affirm the concurrent decisions of the Court of Appeal and the state's governorship election petition tribunal, which dismissed Mr. Wada's petition. In the second appeal filed by the SDP and its governorship candidate, Natasha Akoti, the Apex Court also announced its decision to give final verdict on the same day with that of the PDP. While arguing their briefs, the two appellants had pleaded with the panel to set aside the findings of the Court of Appeal and the Tribunal to allow their appeal to succeed. We are in pursuit of justice, and justice we came here to seek, and justice we pray we get. And uh, we have done what we need to do. Appeal has been adjourned to the 31st for judgments. So we leave the rest for their lordships to do what they needed to do. In their separate arguments, lawyers to the respondents ask for an outright dismissal of the appeal. On our part, we have argued our case and that um, the appeal lacks merit and should be dismissed. So we leave it for the Supreme Court to decide on our submission. We are very happy. That is uh, the PDP matter. 
uh, and uh, the matter is DP matter. Yes, uh, we are happy because we have adopted our arguments, judgment will come up on the 31st, and we await what the Supreme Court decides on the issues tabled before them today. A third appeal filed by the Democratic People's Party and its governorship candidate, Usman Mohammed, was however dismissed after it was withdrawn by the appellants. The appeal was sequel to the court's prompting on the eligibility of its candidate, who was said to be 31 years instead of the mandatory 35 years. To education, the Governing Council of the University of Lagos has ratified the election of Professor Falasha Deogunshala as the Acting Vice-Chancellor of the institution. The confirmation was done at an emergency Governing Council virtual meeting presided over by the newly appointed Acting Chairman of the Council, Dr. John Momo. On Monday, the University Senate members elected Professor Falasha Deogunshala as the Acting Vice-Chancellor of the school, who until her election was the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Development Services. The federal government had directed that the university Senate nominate an acting Vice-Chancellor from among its members for confirmation by the Governing Council after the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Oluwatonyo Gundipe, and the Chairman of the Governing Council, Dr. Wali Babalaki, step aside from their official duties pending the outcome of a special visitation panel set by President Mohamed Buhari to resolve the crisis rocking the institution. To security in Ogun State, where the police have shot dead a suspected serial killer allegedly terrorizing residents of Iperu and Ogiri Axis of the state. The State Commissioner of Police says the 28-year-old suspect has been on the wanted list of the police for quite some time and was shot dead during a raid on his hideout. We were able to have a pinpoint uh, location of where he was hiding in the bush and we engaged him. Uh, he broke bottles again, drew the cutlasses. The cutlass is in the, uh, the vehicle there in case you want to see it, the one he had been using to hurt people to death. Then, of course, we replied. Uh, we maimed him on the leg. Unfortunately, uh, it turned out, to be, uh, turned out to be a fatal injury. While the state governor, Mr. Dakwa Biodu, on his part, explains that the suspected serial killer was alleged to have killed about seven people at different locations in the area. He warns criminals to steer clear of Ogun State. We will not rest until we flush you out. We will not harbor any criminal in any guise. Whatever it is you call yourself, either you are a kidnapper, you are an armed robber, or you are a cultist. For us, you are all the same. We will leave no stone unturned until we flush you out and bring you to book. This state is the gateway state. We intend to ensure that we continue to provide that enabling environment for a public-private sector partnership which you believe is very fundamental to the economic growth of this state and the individual prosperity of you and I. Staying with security matters, the Air Task Force of Operation Lafia Dolis has launched massive simultaneous airstrikes against Boko Haram insurgents terrorizing two settlements on the fringes of the Lake Chad in Borno State. The Air Force said in a statement that the airstrikes were carried out in Kiritawugo and Sabun Tumbu with several leaders of the terrorist groups killed. The statement explains that some ISWAP leaders and fighters had relocated to the area due to the impact of the recent airstrikes at the nearby island settlements of Tumba Baba. It adds that the fighter jets and helicopter gunships attacked the two locations, scoring devastating hits which claimed the lives of prominent terrorist leaders, including Abu Imrana, the ISWAP naval commander, as well as Malam Ibrahim and Malam Abba, all believed to be amongst many casualties. To River State now, Governor Yesen Wike has described using the academia for electoral malpractice by the political class in the country. The governor made the comments when the acting vice chancellor of the University of Port Harcourt, Stephen Okoduru, paid him a curtsy visit. He asked the new VC to restore his alma mater to a true citadel of learning that is reputed for. Our correspondent, Jeff Rizzono, reports. 
top echelon of the University of Port Harcourt, led by the acting Vice Chancellor Professor Stephen Okodudu, awaiting Governor Yeson Wike's arrival at the Council Chambers of Government House. After the arrival of their host and exchange of pleasantries, the acting Vice Chancellor thanks the Governor for supporting his alma mater and seeks for greater partnership in its future development aspirations. You are aware that the reward for good work is more work. An unknown philosopher said that the man whose sheep has bettered always has his relative waiting at the seashore. Therefore, like Oliver Twist, I strongly solicit your support for me as your fellow alumnus and your teacher, just as you supported my predecessors in office through the construction of an iconic project which will be named after you, sir. For the governor, this is one meeting filled with nostalgia. His former lecturer is now the hem of affairs of his alma mater, and he has a simple message for him. Bring back the good old days. Beyond that, Governor Wiki cautions members of the academia from being used by the political class in compromising electoral processes. But for what I've seen now, everybody who wants to be a vice chancellor must align itself to a politician so that they will use their lecturers or those who make themselves available to come and read a lecture. I say the part now is one of those universities that when the politicians have not penetrated. And it's, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. That was not the university I attended. So please return by the university the way it's supposed to, to be. That respect. With this visit and the assurances from the River State Governor for support, hopefully the 45-year-old institution should be wearing a new look in the near future. Jeffrey Uzongo, Channels Television News. The federal government is working on getting the funds to pay outstanding debt for the rollout of the digital switchover. Delivering his address at the opening ceremony of the digital switchover stakeholders meeting, the Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed, explains that there will be no longer subsidy to any firm as it plans to resume the rollout of digital switchover. Mr. Mohammed, Malaji Mohammed, adds that the stakeholders meeting is expected to come up with a strategic plan for the rollout exercise to resume. If indeed there's a good time to resume the DS rollout, it is now. Why? Because moving ahead with the DSO is critical to the post-COVID prosperity of not just creative industry, but of the whole country. Hence, it has been taken as a priority of this ministry. We've made tremendous progress in our efforts to get the much needed funds for the DSO process, in particular to pay outstanding debts that will ginger stakeholders to resume the rollout and bring the massive benefits of the DSO to Nigeria. As I speak, we are at a high level talks with the Federal Ministry of Finance and we are also putting finishing touches to a memo we plan to send to the Federal Reserve Council as part of our relentless efforts to secure the funds to restart the process. I will be pursuing a full private sector driven DSO and there will be no more subsidies, either of set up boxes or of signal carriage. This process must be self sustaining. This meeting must come up with a, strateg with a strategic plan for a resume rollout with an express commitment to continue with the process until every state has been covered. When the news at 10 returns, President Mohamed Buhari approves one year deferment of 35% import levy imposed on electricity meters. That's on Business News. Please join us again. Welcome back to politics in Edo State. The All Progressives Congress governorship candidate in Edo State, Pastor Osage Zeyamu, has promised to reduce rural urban migration through improved infrastructure development and job creation. 
He stated this during his ward to ward rally in Owen East local government area, where he said his simple agenda manifesto is the roadmap to the rapid development of Edo State. <laughs> PC governorship campaign team resumes its ward campaigns across the state in Arofo Ward 7 in Owa East local government area of the state. The party's leadership and its governorship candidate, Pastor Saige Zayamu, are really out the APC's manifesto to the people. The pitch is geared towards getting their votes in the upcoming Edo governorship election. I want to introduce you now to my simple agenda. The man who is there right now, he don't get agenda. All he do last time, that the high order show money back. He not be done what he go do. But me, I get simple agenda. And with that simple agenda, we now go see development for this noble government. Combination of the youth, of the energy of the youth, the passion of the women, and the wisdom of our elders. When we weave it together, and you get to your various words and villages, and explain to them, this darkness we are in is not from God, it's from Obaseki. Now there's somebody who is bringing light. From Ward 7, the campaign train moves further inwards to Otwa and Afuze wards. <laughs> While the leaders explain the importance of voting for the APC in the election, the people on the flip side have their expectations. Give us good roads. That is one of our main priorities. Education, we can upgrade our... College of uh, Physical Education. Owa East has been left out in terms of political appointment and other things. Employment, we have been left out. We can't boast of any employment in this local government. And uh, it's, it's not something that we are very proud of. From Afuze, the campaign tour heads to Ihewe and Warake, all in Owa East local government area. Thank you. Bring it down. As they pursue these votes relentlessly, the APC says that it's confident that the energy expended as they crisscross these walls will be duly rewarded with victory when the votes are counted. Meanwhile, the People's Democratic Party also continued its campaign across Edo State ahead of next month's governorship election as the campaign trail arrived in Ovia Northeast local government area. The party's flag bearer, Governor Godwin Obaseki, called on its supporters to ensure that they defend their votes on September 19th, which he boasted will be in favor of the PDP. The empty market stalls close to a lively stage nearby suggests that only one commodity is marketed. The PDP governorship ticket of Governor Godwin Obaseki and his deputy, Philip Shaibu. The PDP's ward to ward campaigns resume after a short break. It's the turn of Edo South, starting with Ovia Northeast local government area. The campaign team shows no sign of fatigue after completing two senatorial districts, motivating the crowd to key into the PDP manifesto, which they say translates into a better future for the people. The party insists that Governor Basaki's credentials as a governorship candidate are not in doubt. The campaign council chairman adds that the opposition also confirmed it. He has used his brain, his knowledge, his resources, his industry to impact positively in his government. As we visit Ward 7 in Ovia Northeast, I want to use this opportunity to challenge the APC candidate. Pastor Osage Ezeyamu to tell us to tell us what he did to impact on the government 
he served as secretary to government. While maintaining that the PDP will carry the day, Governor Godwin Obaseki wants party members to ensure the votes count. I want you to help me defend the votes. <laughs> When you finish voting, go and stand. Come back about 30 meters and stand and wait and watch. Let them count your vote first. Record it. Announce it before you leave your polling unit. Amen. The high point of the day's activities include projects commissioning, water borehole in Itaku, and a primary health care center in Ekiadalo. To some company reports, First Bank of Nigeria Limited is partnering with Unity Limited on The Voice Nigeria 2020, the third season of the acclaimed reality TV talent show created to discover and promote new voices in the music industry. The Chief Executive Officer of First Bank of Nigeria Limited explains why the company is supporting the initiative, which he describes as being in tandem with First Bank's commitments to providing a platform for nurturing and showcasing talent and driving social cohesion. For over 126 years, First Bank has been at the forefront of nation building, supporting through resourceful partnerships to build Nigerian creative industry value chain. Nigeria's creative industry has over the years played a critical role in influencing the growth of African art and culture, and indeed a major contributor to Nigeria's GDP. The creative industry contribution to GDP is put at 2.3%. The Nigerian music industry, a significant part of arts, entertainment and recreation, grew by 9% in 2016 to reach a value of $39 million and is projected to grow by 13.4% CAGA by 2021. First Bank's support for The Voice Nigeria is a demonstration of the bank's commitment to contributing to the projected revenue of $86 million by 2021 from the Nigerian music industry, aimed at promoting a diversified economy in line with the federal government of Nigeria's economic diversification policy. Organizers of the show, Unity Limited, speak on the inspiration behind The Voice 2020 and encourage participation. Our objectives are to build the brand and also to build the capacity in Nigeria for these types of uh, shows. I'm asking you to engage with us on social media. Don't just watch. Get on YouTube, get on TikTok, get on Instagram, get on, call your friends, call your enemies, uh, make them watch this. Let's make this a great Nigerian brand. We need to own it. It is our own. Come on the journey with us as we launch The Voice Nigeria Season 3. The Voice Nigeria is open to Nigerian citizens from the ages of 18 to 50 years old. Registration is online and the registration is from August 20th and closes on September 19th, 2020. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Hello and welcome to Business News. President Muhammad Buhari has approved a one-year deferment of 35% import adjustment tax imposed fully on built units electricity meters in efforts to make them more affordable for Nigerians. The approval for the adjustment follows a request by the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Mrs. Zainab Ahmed, to support the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission roll out 3 million electricity meters under the meter asset provider framework. The 35% import adjustment tax on the electricity meters, which was early approved in 2015, attracted a 10% import duty rate under the ECOWAS Common External Tariff. Meanwhile, data from NERC shows that a total of 6 million youth consumers have been captured to date who indicated interest for these meters. 
The African Development Bank today began its two-day annual meeting for the first time in the bank's history. Its delegates and shareholders are meeting virtually. At the same time, the meeting is being held alongside the bank's much-awaited election, where incumbent president Mr. Akimumi Adeshino is expected to retain his position for the next five years after being cleared of alleged favoritism in an independent review panel on June the 28th. The Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin Emefele, is set to meet with chief executives of multinational companies in Nigeria to discuss rebuilding the Nigerian export. At the meeting of the Bankers Committee today, Mr. Emefele says that the CBN is ready to encourage and revamp the Nigeria export sector through deliberate policies that will boost investment and create jobs. He also explained that the Apex Bank will work with the Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment to ensure the facilitation of a reboot of the Nigerian port market. In a related development, Mr. Mefiele asked banks to support airlines in the country to enable the aviation industry recover from the crisis caused by COVID-19. Meanwhile, the Bankers Committee has unanimously agreed to extend special facilities to Nigerian registered airlines and local media industry to enable them adequately address the negative impact of the coronavirus pandemic. And still with the central bank, it has directed banks in the country to submit names, bank verification numbers and addresses of exporters that fail to repatriate proceeds of their businesses for further action. The latest directive, which was issued today at the virtual meeting of the Bankers Committee, comes barely 24 hours after the CBN announced the ban on forex payment to third parties for import document forms, also known as Form M. The CBN further explains that the directive is aimed at ensuring prudent use of the country's foreign exchange resources. Meanwhile, the CBN and the Bankers Committee have now threatened heavy sanctions against exporters who default in repatriation foreign exchange proceeds from their international business. Let's see how the market fared today. The trading session went higher by 0.25% following significant gains by key industrial goods and of course the insurance sector. Layu Adegoke has the details. Thank you for joining us for the stock market report. It appears that investors are not holding back their interest as the stock market continues to defy concerns over the economy a day after the second quarter GDP data was released by the Bureau of Statistics. This time, the industrial goods sector was the toast of the market and the reason is not far-fetched. Bois Cement and Lafarge Africa. These two cement giants contributed largely to the 1.10% increase in sectors index, which overshadowed losses from the banking, oil and gas, as well as the consumer goods counter. And the results, a higher 0.25% gain on the all share index when compared to the 0.03% rise recorded on Monday. Traders say investors are taking position in the shares of Bois Cement as it is currently undervalued, while payment dates for dividend to its shareholders is around the corner. Meanwhile, the total volume of shares traded today was slightly higher compared with previous session, while market breadth ended with a negative margin of 15 gainers led by NEM Insurance against 19 losers led by the shares of Better Glass. And that is on the Stock Market Report. I'm Layo Adegoke. Thank you, Laya. Well, apart from Wall Street, major global markets were down today in the red, but let's see how they all ended today. Business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Wawada. The rest of news at 10 continues now with Ulumi Day. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Watching music renditions from the commendation service held in honor of former governor of Old Ondo, 
evangelist Pamidele Olimiloa, who passed away in June. The event held in Akure, the Ondo State Capital, had the family of the deceased, the state governor, Rotimi Akirdolu, friends and associates in attendance. Describing him as a progressive politician who served the state and the nation meritoriously, Governor Akirdolu says Ondo State owes the late governor an eternal gratitude for his visionary leadership. that it was during his training as governor that the status of Fondo State changed and became an oil producing state. Indeed, when the history of Yoruba land is being recounted, Evangelist Bamidele Onobilua's name will be written in gold. It is his student, Honor of us, therefore, all of us who are gathered here today to honor this great man who is lying there, to reflect on the life and times of the late Israelites. On the foreign scene, 29 year old Jacob Blake may not walk again, as his father says, is paralyzed from the waist down. Jacob was shot severely in the back by Wisconsin police officers who said they were responding to a domestic incident, but they've given no details of what led to the shooting. Within hours of the shooting, hundreds marched on the Kenosha police headquarters, even defying a curfew imposed on the city. Here's Simon Pusey with more international news in Around the World in 5. Well, we as Africans... Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in 5. U.S. President Donald Trump has warned supporters that Democratic opponents may try to steal November's election as his party anointed him as their candidate for the White House. Mr. Trump has repeatedly suggested an unprecedented surge in postal voting could lead to widespread fraud, even though experts and voting officials say this is a false conspiracy theory. Opinion polls suggest he is lagging behind the Democratic candidate, Joe Biden. We caught them doing some really bad things in 2016. Let's see what happens. We caught them doing some really bad things. We have to be very careful because they're trying it again with this whole 80 million mail-in ballots that they're working on, uh, sending them out to people that didn't ask for them. They didn't ask. They just get them. And it's not fair and it's not right and it's not going to be possible to tabulate, in my opinion. It's just my opinion. There have been clashes for a second night in Wisconsin with buildings and cars set on fire following the police shooting of an unarmed black man. Video of the Kenosha shooting taken from across the street and shared on social media shows Mr. Blake leaning into the car and an officer grabbing his shirt before shooting him numerous times in the back. Protesters defied a dusk-to-dawn curfew as they confronted law enforcement officers in riot gear outside the county courthouse, blocks away from where the incident took place. Mr. Blake survived the shooting and is in a stable condition following surgery. Some protesters set fires and threw bricks and petrol bombs at police, leading authorities to close public buildings and prompting Governor Tony Evers to order National Guard troops to help maintain order. The Berlin hospital treating the seriously ill Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny says he appears to have been poisoned. The hospital released a statement saying clinical evidence suggests an intoxication through a poisonous substance, but doctors who treated him in Russia say the substance was not present. Mr. Navalny fell ill in an internal flight in Russia on Thursday. His supporters suspect poison was placed in a cup of tea at the airport in Tomsk. Ex-Bosnian Serb commander Ratko Mladic is appealing against his conviction for genocide and crimes against humanity at a court in The Hague. Known as the Butcher of Bosnia, Mladic was jailed for life in November 2017. He was the military commander of Bosnian Serb forces against Bosnian Croat and Bosnian armies. The court found he significantly contributed to the genocide in Srebrenica in 1995, where more than 7,000 Bosniak men and boys were murdered. 
Dozens of people are feared to still be trapped in the debris of a five-story building collapsed in an industrial town in western India. Emergency services say they have found 76 people alive, including this four-year-old boy who was pulled from the rubble and carried to safety. But there are still around 14 people unaccounted for. The building contained around 47 flats and fell like a deck of cards, according to a police officer. Authorities have yet to ascertain the cause of the collapse and the number of casualties, while local residents suggest the old and cracked building imploded due to torrential rain. The sinking of the stem of the Japanese bulk carrier that caused a huge oil spill off the coast of Mauritius has been completed. The operation started on Friday but was slowed down because of rough sea conditions during the weekend. Japan's disaster relief team helping the cleanup of the massive oil spill said oil contamination and the body of the stranded vessel could further deteriorate the sea environment. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has arrived in Sudan from Israel as the United States promotes stronger ties between the two countries. Mr. Pompeo will meet Sudan's Prime Minister and the head of its ruling council during a brief stopover in Khartoum to discuss U.S. support for the civilian-led government and for deepening the Sudan-Israel relationship. The U.S. has been restoring its own ties with Sudan following the ousting of the former leader Omar al-Bashir in April last year. And finally, to make sure Christmas can go ahead as usual, Santas in the UK have had training lessons to learn how they can make traditional grottos COVID safe this year. And welcome to the first socially distanced edition of Santa School. The entertainment company Ministry of Fun has been running Santa School for 25 years and this year decided to get everyone together even earlier than normal to reassure their clients and the public that it's possible to make the experience safe. This year Santa will wear a customised mask, there will be socially distanced grottos and a new system to avoid personal contact between children and Santa during the traditional gift giving using a sleigh. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. The Nigeria Football Federation has endorsed the final table of the Nigeria Professional Football League for the 2020 season as prepared and released by the league management company. The NFF Football Committee resolved that the LMC followed due process in arriving at the points per game decision and its application. Lionel Messi has told FC Barcelona that he wants to leave the club after nearly two decades at the camp now. A club source confirmed that the Argentine sent a document expressing his desire to leave. The announcement comes 11 days after Barcelona's 8-2 humiliating loss to Bayern Munich in the Champions League quarterfinals. The defeat capped a difficult season for Barca, and the first without a trophy since the 2007-08 season. Harry Maguire has been withdrawn from England's national team for next month's Nations League matches after being found guilty of three charges by a Greek court. Maguire had initially been selected for the September fixtures, but later on Tuesday, the Manchester United skipper was given a 21-month suspended prison sentence after being found guilty of aggravated assault, resisting arrest and repeated attempts of bribery. And Dallas Mavericks power forward Kristaps Porzingis has been ruled out of Game 5 of the Western Conference first round series against the Los Angeles Clippers. It will be the second consecutive game that Porzingis misses due to a right knee soreness after missing the overtime Game 4 win on Sunday. Porzingis is averaging 23.7 points and 8.7 rebounds in the first playoff series of his career. And that's Rap and Sports News. I'm Ayotunde Balu. Thank you, Ayo. And the main news again. The World Health Organization today declared Nigeria and the rest of Africa polio-free 40 years after eradicating smallpox on the continent. Also today, President Muhammad Buhari listed poverty, eradication, education and healthcare amongst nine priority focus of his government in the next three years. And the father of a black man shot severely in the back by a Wisconsin police today said his son is paralyzed from the waist down. That's it on the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Olumide Mukolli.